Welcome. Welcome to Take Stock Live, uh, the investor webinar series going live every Wednesday, 15 minutes after market close. We're now in the home stretch of season two with the final episode coming up on October 28th. Uh, next week, um, we have some mining for you. Uh, coming up next week is um, Banyan Gold, BYN, Great Panther Mining, GPR, Rock Haven Resources, RK. I uh, hope uh, some of you, all of you can join us next week for that. We would like to thank the TMX Group and TSX Venture Exchange, our event partner, for helping us keep the conversation between companies and investors going in these very unusual times. We'd also like to recognize the support, the vital support provided by our core sponsors, Faskin, MNP, Lee Jones Gable, Olympia Trust, and the Canadian Securities Exchange, who helped us get the whole show going back in 2014. We'd also like to thank our supporters um, through our extended network for their support in um, making Take Stock Live happen. We'd like to thank Calgary Meg and CIM, the Manitoba and Saskatchewan Prospectors and Developers, CHF Capital, Sterling Capital, Conduit Capital, and many others. Particular thanks also to Investment Pitch Media and to the Newswire for helping get the word out. At this point, I'd like to Turn the mic over to my colleague, Mark Francis. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, Raj, and welcome all of you, our attendees and our guest presenter. Note our disclaimer, this presentation is for information only and is not a solicitation to buy or sell stock. Companies may pay fee or do pay fees to present a take stock and take stock and its principles, Raj Joshi and yours truly, may have equity investments in companies we invite to present, may consult to the companies, and make no representation or investment or other recommendation in regards to these presenting or any other companies. You should do due diligence, utilize CDAR and SETI, look at the financial statements, and seek professional investment advice. Some housekeeping matters for you. You will note a red reconnect tab at the top of your screen. If you lose audio, just click it and you will be reconnected. The chat board will be utilized in this session, in particular for questions. Please be clear, well, we only have one today, so we'll know it's for Corey Giasson. But please use the chat board for serious investor and technical questions. So today we have Corey Giasson, CEO of Must Grow Biologics, MGRO on CSE, great symbol. Must Grow is developing a natural biocide for agriculture as an alternative to synthetic chemicals. Contact details for Mr. Giasson can be found on our website, takestocklive.com, and in the chat board. Corey is an entrepreneur who has been focused on the agriculture, potash, oil and gas, mining, and real estate industries in his home province of Saskatchewan for the past 20 years. He is co-founder and director of Legacy Capital Corp., a private equity company focused on participating in management buyouts of strong, sustainable, cash-flowing businesses. In 2009, Corey co-founded Saskatchewan-based heavy oil company, Rallymont Energy Inc., and was president and CEO. Rallymont successfully explored for and delineated, delineated the Prince Thermal Heavy Oil Project and sold to Husky Energy in December 2013. Prior to Rallymont, Corey was an independent consultant to a group of companies, including Pan Western Energy, Infrastructure Materials Corp., and Anglo Potash Limited, which was formerly Anglo Minerals Limited. That's when I first met Corey and had an opportunity to buy in and failed to do so. Corey was the VP and it was ultimately purchased by its JV partner, BHB Billiton, in July 2008 for $284 million. Corey has an MBA and a BSc in Agricultural Economics, both from the University of Saskatchewan. Corey, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks, Raj. Um, for inviting me again to present here uh, at Take Stock. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Corey Jasson here with uh, Musgrove Biologics Corp. Uh, we're an ag biotech company based in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And um, our objective is to use the mustard seed, most of which is uh, growing in Southern Saskatchewan and Alberta, uh, to use that mustard seed uh, for a purpose other than for food. 
Um, the, the mustard seed has some very natural um, properties that can um, de defend the plant from pl uh, pests and diseases. And uh, we've, uh, we want to, um, basically we've extracted those compounds and brought them back in a commercial form so that they can be used uh, as a biopesticide. Um, so. There, um, I draw your attention to our disclaimer. Uh, it's your typical forward looking disclaimer and it can be uh, read at our website. About Musgrove, again, we're an egg biotech company uh, focused on providing natural science-based solutions to replace synthetic chemicals. And our objective is to use the mustard seed to do that. Uh, mustard has been grown for generations as a cover crop. Uh, farmers will grow the plant. Uh, it'll turn to seed in about 60 days. Uh, they'll pl plow it back into the soil and the natural compounds within this seed uh, are, can be used very effectively to treat soil-borne pests and diseases. Uh, after they uh, grow the crop and, and to, uh, plow it back into the soil, they'll come back in and grow the crop that they, they plan to harvest. Um, we basically have just harnessed uh, what nature has provided uh, to the mustard seed and the brassica plant. Uh, we feel that right now for Mustro, um, we're hitting the market at very good timing. Uh, global chemistries are being banned or deregistered, and, and it's all being driven by consumers and, and, and re uh, regulators. Uh, consumers want healthy and safe, sustainable food products, and, um, and, and regulators are, are moving that way as well. Producers, uh, I grew up on a farm in southwest Saskatchewan, so I, I know what it's like to, uh, to uh, grow a crop. And, um, you know, producers, they want to use healthy and safe products, but most importantly, they want to be able to harvest the crop and um, be able to uh, see the works of their labor um, um, turn, into, uh, turn into economics and that. And, and um, if you can provide both, which we believe Musgrove can, uh, there, there is, uh, there's something to be said, not only uh, to provide a healthy, natural, safe product that consumers We'll want to eat the food that comes from it, but also a very effective product compared to synthetic chemicals. We own 100% of our technology. Again, we extract the natural compounds from the mustard seed. It's a natural biopesticide, and we completed over 110 independent studies over the last several years that shows that the product is very safe and efficacious compared to synthetic chemicals. Now with our new liquid formulation, not only are we seeing the efficacy, but also there's great potential that we can compete on price versus synthetic chemicals. And not only is it a natural biopesticide, but there's a great um, opportunity here for it to be a natural uh, bioherbicide. Uh, we have shown and done testing that shows that it does kill weeds and weed seeds, um, which uh, can be very, which is another market segment that can be very important to us. Um, and this is all with a very tight capital structure, 37 million shares outstanding on the CSE uh, under the ticker symbol MGRO. Uh, management advisors have 22% of the total shares. And we're sitting on about $2.3 million of cash right now, which is enough money for us to complete our uh, PMRA and EPA registration, hopefully within the next uh, year or so. And in addition, uh, do some of the blue sky testing, which I will highlight in this presentation. A little bit more about our team, our chief operating officer, Colin Bletsky. Uh, he joined me uh, about uh, three years ago now. Uh, Colin has a lot of experience in the agriculture chem, chem area, specifically globally. Uh, his last role was with um, Novozymes as a VP of BioAg, and he looked at hundreds of different biological products around the world. He also looked at Musgrove um, back in the day and was very interested in our technology. Um, and now with this new liquid formulation, Colin was excited to uh, come over and join us and help uh, commercialize this technology and, and get it into the, the different market segments uh, in the agriculture industry. I'll draw your attention to uh, Todd Lottie, our CFO, and, and Dr. Dave Maines, uh, our scientific and production advisor. Um, Todd has a tremendous amount of experience. He's been done over $2.4 billion in transactions, M&A deals, finance deals. Um, he was previously president of MCN Bioproducts. MCN Bioproducts uh, had a technology which was invented by Dr. Dave Mains, which extracted the nat or sorry, extracted the proteins from the canola seed and canola seed and mustard seed. They're both brassica oil seeds. Uh, so, um, you know, Dr. Dave Mains came up with our technology of extracting the compounds from um, uh, from the, the mustard seed as well. And um, so, I guess what I'm what I'm trying to say is that the it's been done before with canola with MCN Bioproducts, and uh, they sold that 
company off to Bungie in 2012. So the expertise, uh, we have a lot of expertise in our company from, from not only on the ag chem side, but also on the extraction side and, uh, and uh, um, ag biotech side as well. As I mentioned, uh, we're hitting at a very good time here in the market. Uh, global ag chemistries are being banned, synthetic chemicals. You know, you're hearing uh, glyphosate being banned, being phased out in Mexico. Uh, other, other harmful chemicals such as metam sodium in France, et cetera. Um, you know, that's, that's quite important for us because we're providing a natural biological product that can help replace them. And the fact of the matter is, is the global population is continuing to increase and you know the demand for food is going to continue to grow and farmers are going to need products safe products to help them uh, grow these crops um, in the in the future and uh, replace uh, some of these chemicals that are these synthetic chemicals that have been banned and we think that our mustard product uh, has a good potential to do that in some market segments the difference between biologics and chemistries well chemistries as you know are very effective uh, at doing, uh, at, at controlling, say, pests or disease or, or killing weeds, uh, but they also can be very harmful. And some of them are, are very are harmful enough that they've caused, are, are ca cancer causing, for instance, methyl bromide uh, for um, uh, fruit and vegetable workers. Biologics, on the other hand, uh, are, can be safe, natural, uh, organic, but for a lot of time, a lot, a lot of them, they're not as effective. They are not as effective at controlling those diseases, for instance, they, they represent more of a suppression of these diseases. So they don't, you know, eradicate the disease in the soil, for instance. What we're seeing is, with our mustard-based product is that not only is it uh, a natural, safe, and organic, in fact, it's made from food-grade mustard, but it's also just as effective as chemistries. And, and we've, have, we've completed numerous studies, independent studies, uh, not only in the labs, but also in the greenhouses that show that this is true. About our technology, again, we own 100% of the, the patents on it. It's derived from food grade mustard. We've completed over 110 independent trials, organic, natural, and safe. And our original technology, which is uh, granular based, is registered with the EPA as a biopesticide and, and with the PMRA as a biopesticide. Uh, it's in granular format. We are now with this new liquid formulation, uh, working with the EPA to get it registered in the U.S. And, and with PMRA to get it registered here in Canada um, and, and basically just bridge that existing granular registration to the new liquid formulation. Same active ingredient, both are made from food gate mustard, but just in a different form. Uh, one's in granular and bulky, the other one is in uh, liquid form. And we hope to have that completed in 2021. For fruit and vegetable growers, um, this is our, our, our initial target industry in which we're looking to get our, our EPA registration complete. Again, we, were, we had sales of our uh, granular product into the U.S., into the fruit and vegetable industries. It was a bulky granular product. Uh, farmers were plying it at 1,000 to 2,000 pounds per acre. There was over about $700,000 of sales over about a year. Um, these fruit and vegetable growers, they didn't want to apply a granular product. They want to apply a liquid product through their drip lines. And that allowed us to come up with our, our second generation technology. What we're seeing is that at two and a half to five gallons an acre, uh, we're seeing that we can control these key soil borne diseases, such as fusarium or petritus, have 100% control. So instead of applying the product at, say, 1,000 or 2,000 pounds an acre, uh, farmers might be able to apply it at, say, five gallons an acre to get the same, uh, the same effect, the same efficacy. And if you look at the fruit and vegetable industry, it's about it's estimated by 2025 um, for fruit and vegetable soil fumigations, estimated to be about $1.2 billion US globally. In the US, it's a, it'll be about 500 million. Currently, it's about $360 million uh, of product sales. Um, if we were to penetrate 10% of that, that would be $50 million of revenue for Musgrow. And 10%, uh, I don't think would be too out of line when you consider the organic acres in addition, um, if you look at the 20% of the existing fruit and vegetable crop is designated as a buffer zone, meaning that it's near schools, farms, or uh, roads, and um, uh, where, where chemicals can't be applied. So with a natural product coming into the market, uh, there's an opportunity for those farmers to, to you know, gain some of the acreage that they've lost due to these buffer areas, uh, which is estimated to be 20% of uh, the U.S. crop. 
the fruit and vegetable industry is you know, our initial target area, but there's a lot of different market segments that this technology can be applicable for. Um, for instance, on Clubroot, we've done testing. And what, what you see here are, are, are the, uh, the, the bubbles, I guess, the market segments of, of these. And yellow is where we've done testing. Blue would be blue sky areas, areas that we haven't yet done testing, but we plan to do so in the very near future. So this past summer, we did testing on Clubroot. Uh, we had 100% control of the disease in the lab that we then moved it out to the greenhouse uh, and grew a canola plant um, uh, in in these particular pots um, and we at uh, I believe it was five gallons an acre uh, two and a half gallons an acre we had 96.5 percent control and I believe at five gallons an acre five or ten gallons an acre we had 98.5 percent control anything over 90 percent is unheard of in fact, there is no product out there that will control club root. It's a huge disease that is affecting the Canadian canola crop. There's about 20 million acres grown annually here in Western Canada. And if you get club root uh, in your soil or on your land, um, it's very easy to, to transport to other areas of your, uh, your farm. And in addition, once you get it in there, there's no products that works, work and you will not be able to grow canola on that acre for about 17 years. Again, canola from many farmers out here is the number one cash crop. So uh, it's a very uh, dev devastating disease. And um, if, if, uh, if there's a, a solution and Musgrove has it here, it could be very important for uh, canola growers in Western Canada. Uh, tobacco and nematodes. There's been lots of testing that we've done in our product for the tobacco or, or for, for nematodes. And, 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 and um, nematodes are a huge issue in the tobacco crop um, in, in the U.S., and that so we plan to do we're, we're currently doing more testing there and and um and uh, moving that uh, product our, our product potentially forward for the tobacco growers uh non-selective herbicide we did testing this summer in this area as well and uh killed weeds and weeds weed seeds uh, um we're looking to do more testing of that in the very near future um it's going to be in the in the greenhouse here over the winter and then moving that into uh, uh field trials next uh starting next spring and that on the blue side, blue scale uh, side, the uh, bananas in Panama, we've announced that um, uh, Columbia imported product uh, a while back, but due to COVID, they had slowed down, um, uh, I guess, their testing. Uh, and we just recently got approval to start testing on this particular disease of Fusarium. It's called um, Fusarium TR, um, TR4 uh, wilt. And um, it's a, it's a, it's devastating the uh, banana crops um, in um, Latin America and Asia, and um, it, uh, you know Colombia, for instance, has announced a state of emergency uh, uh, for that particular country in terms of this crop. It's um, you know one of the number one exported uh, fruits in the world, and um, very important not only for the farmers that grow it, but for the workers that work in those plantations. Um, a very important crop, and we look forward to hopefully getting results back uh, within the next month or so. Um, grain toxins, you know, for stored grains, Fusarium, for instance, is a is a mycotoxin that affects stored grains. Uh, with it, with infected crop, um, that stored grain cannot be used for consumption. Um, it basically has to be destroyed. Um, we're looking to see if our product can also control the types of toxins such as fusarium that affect stored grains. And we'll be looking to do that test in the very near future. And uh, these blue sky testing that, uh, tests that I'm mentioning here, um, you know, they're not very costly. For instance, for us to do our initial tub test on club root, you know, cost us $3,000. So they're not very costly, but they are definitely opening up different market segments and applications for the technology that we own. And, um, you know, that's quite important uh, for us going forward because, there, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, lot of different uh, areas where this technology could be used. And this is all with a very tight capital structure, 37 million shares outstanding. I mentioned there's $2.3 million of cash on hand. Uh, that's enough money for us to get our registration completed with the EPA. Um, and in addition to do that blue sky testing, uh, in the very near future. Um, so for the next two years or so, we'll have enough work money on hand to get this work completed and, um, and start moving these technology, this technology into to not only in the fruit and vegetable industry, but also mark other market segments within the agriculture industry. Um, thank you for your time and uh, open up to questions.
Thanks very much, Corey. Um, do you want to just uh, start here by backing up one slide? Yeah, sure. There we go. Um, and I'll just pop off here for a second, but I'll ask you a question. Uh, is, is that your current cash, cash position? Yes. O over $2 million? Yes. I'm reading it correctly. Okay. Okay. That's great. I just want, just want to double check that. Um, I'll take the deck off now. Um, feel free to refer back to it if you want. Uh, we can always load it up if you, if you like. Got that luxury this time. Yeah. Um, let, let's kick off the questions. Actually, uh, a question from John Elson, one of our one of our regular uh, attendees, supporters, investors. Um, will this affect bees in any way? Uh, no, it shouldn't have any effect on bees. Um, the nice thing about our product is that it's pre-plant treatment of soil. Mm -hmm. So um, the bees won't be out pollinating the plants. Uh, you know, the, the farmer actually has to wait probably about, you know, uh, 10 to 14 days before they can come and plant a crop. Um, so there would be no bees pollinating at the time when there's planting going on. In addition, um, the product dissipates from the soil within 24 hours and uh, does its work. And, it, it, you know, it, um, the AITC has a very short half-life, uh, you know, so it, it doesn't last very long in the soil. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is about uh, bananas. Uh, bananas, as you mentioned in your presentation, are grown all over the place. Yes. Not so much. Not, not so much on the prairies, but uh, why? Why Colombia? Is that? Is that? Uh, is there a specific reason why that's the focus of what you guys are doing? Yeah. No. Uh, I, bananas are grown uh, globally, and that I mean, it's one. It's the number one crop, uh, fr fruit crop uh, that is exported globally. Um, okay. It was the first first product to be com uh, global. Uh, commercialized globally and had uh, globalization involved. Uh, okay. why, Colum why Columbia? Well, we were contacted by a group in Colombia. Um, mm -hmm. They announced the state of emergency in that country and there's plantation owners there that are looking for a solution. Uh, we were told that they've tested over 70 different products, synthetic chemicals that haven't worked. So they contacted us um, knowing that we've been able to control Fusarium and, um, uh, we, you know, let's, let's, let's try it out and that's so. mm -hmm. all. So specific opportunity presented yeah. itself and, you, and, and, and you're chasing that. Okay, that sounds good. Um, can you describe the testing process um, and the scale and costs of these tests a little bit further? For bananas? Um, yeah, I think that's pertaining to yeah. bananas. Yeah. I mean, uh, so banana, the testing is being done in Colombia. Um, you know, it, it, relatively inexpensive. We've we've got product for them to, to test and that, and we're estimating that you know the cost would be around ten thousand dollars here um, to do uh, initially a lab study, a lab lab test is what they're doing right now with positive results. We'll then move it to the greenhouse uh, and uh, scale it up from there, and then uh, with positive results on that, move it to, into plantations and do field testing. Okay, sounds good. Um... Will you have to do discrete testing in each country to get uh, permits and registration for use in that specific country? Um, that depends. Um, it, more, more often than not, yes. But this is a, this is a devastating disease. And, um, you know, there is potential that if they see positive results in Colombia, you know, other Latin American countries might fast track um, the permitting process to get it uh, approved in other, uh, other um, countries. And that so it all it all depends. Um, this this Panama disease is um, uh, similar to uh, club root in that in that instance is that once it affects a plantation, it's destroyed. Uh, they they right. can't grow the Cavendish banana there uh, anymore, and um, um, so they're 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 def they're, they're seeking um, uh, solutions and uh, quickly. And that so, before so if, if you get your foot in the door, you think that it'll, it'll sort of sell itself into those other markets. It's in their interest to. Potentially, yeah. Approval process if you get through the first one. Potentially, yes. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, okay, so that, that leads to the next question. Um, in the event of approval in, in this target market, I guess it's Colombia, um, how much of Saskatchewan's mustard crop would must grow absorb just for protecting Colombia's bananas? Oh, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, there's about 130,000 hectares of bananas in Colombia. Uh, it won't be very much of the mustard crop in, uh, in Saskatchewan being used for that for that use and that um, I estimate, you know, for 50,000 acres of strawberries and that we probably only need about five or 8,000 acres of mustard growing here in the province at 30 bushels an acre. 
um, not not a significant amount. It's not going to affect uh, you know the amount of mustard that that we consume on the, from the store shelves, grocery store shelves, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, what's being done with advancing? I, I think actually, considering uh, this question came up before, but um, you touched upon it. Just uh, please just reiterate. Um, advancing the extract for treating club root in canola, uh, the testing that you're doing, and also the marketing that you plan coming out of that. Okay, uh, so uh, what's being done? Uh, well, so we, we had very good results in the lab and in the greenhouse uh, mm -hmm. this past summer. Uh, we are now waiting for the crop, I guess, it, oh, have to wait. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing some more lab tests over the winter here, but, uh, or not lab tests, uh, greenhouse uh, testing over the winter. But big thing is, is that we're gonna start field trials starting next spring and that unfortunately we've got uh, five or six months of winter maybe six months here in saskatchewan and we've got to wait for that to uh, but we're very excited to be able to move it uh into the field and uh you know we're getting a lot a lot of a, a lot of um calls from farm groups and farmers out there that that um that are seeing uh club roots in club root in their fields specifically in central alberta and uh you know it's it's a it's a devastating uh um, disease that affects their number one cash crop and and nothing has been shown to be able to be effective at controlling it so we're, we're excited to start uh, field trials next next spring don't sound sounds like it absolutely um okay so i'm gonna assume that richard hart and tundi williams um aren't coming on live to speak so i'm going to ask your questions uh, if you have other questions feel free to raise your hand and we'll try to get you on there too uh, so, a question from Richard: um, When will you get uh, permit get permitted for liquid application? Yeah, so for the liquid application, in terms of uh, applying it for fruit and vegetables, uh, turf and ornamental, and also like you know uh, root and tuber crops like uh, potatoes, um, we are in process right now with the EPA to get it registered. Um, we're going back and forth with them on uh, particular questions. Uh, that they have. Again, we, we, we have an existing registration for our granular product. Uh, we're, we're looking to bridge that existing registration to the new liquid formulation. Um, they've got a lot of information on the active ingredient AITC and, uh, and, our, and our, our existing product. And um, again, it, it, both are made from food grade mustard. They're just in different forms. Um, so we, we hopefully I'll have that complete in 2021. That being said, our goal was to actually have it complete in early part of 2021. Um, we're finding that the EPA is, um, has slowed down quite a bit, uh, due to COVID and that, and, um, um, you know, we're hearing it from other, other, other groups that are in the regulatory process that they've, they've slowed down quite a bit, but, but that being said, I mean, it, we still potentially could have it completed in early part of 2021. Um, it just, it, it all depends on, on the government. Fair enough. Um, it's quite understandable, I guess, where they're at, and I guess in the middle of an election cycle and everything. I'm talking about the US EPA, right? Yeah. Correct, yes. Um, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Um, now, the next question here, you might have already touched upon it, so just let me know if you did. I'll, I'll ask it anyway from uh, Tundee Williams. Um, in case of banana with the disease associated with it, how are you positioning your company to fight this deadly disease? Well, uh, in, initially, here we're going to be testing it in the, in the lab. Uh, this disease in the lab um, if we have good efficacy there we'll be moving it to the greenhouse and then into the field uh, the key is is that you know it, it's tough for uh, us being in saskatchewan to deal with um, plantations in columbia but we're dealing with a group right now that contacted us uh, that that uh, that is based in columbia that deals with these plantations and again these 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 growers are looking for solution a solution to this devastating disease and um, um, for us you know with with a uh, positive proof of concept in the lab and moving it forward from there. Um, you know, we look, uh, we're dealing with, with the right groups to get it tested at, you know, with the growers that are out there and, and with positive results, it'll move from Colombia to other uh, Latin American countries and then potentially globally from there. That, um, that sounds good. Um, and I guess it's important to go down in, in January and February and do, do uh, field trials, especially, right? Exactly. Well, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, thinking, thinking of escaping your prairie winter a little bit, but um, okay. So, what 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 other crop applications other than ones you you've mentioned? Is there any others? I mean, you sound mainly focused on on canola and, and bananas. Is that fair? Well, yeah. No, I think if you go back to uh, the presentation there, um, or, mm -hmm. but uh, on that bubble slide that we have, 
there's a lot of different application here. And that's what's interesting is that you know, not only are we going to be treating the diseases for fruit and vegetable, fruit and vegetables, but also potentially the diseases that are the disease that's affecting bananas. Um, we've shown that it can also it ha also has non-selective herbicide properties. So potentially we could be, um, you know, instead of uh, a home and gar home and gardener like myself applying uh, uh, glyphosate or Roundup to kill the so weeds in my yard, there, right? potentially, yeah, that this is perfect. Yep. Yeah, that one right there. We potentially could be um, we could be using a natural product made from mustard to do the exact same thing. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different market segments. Another interesting one I'll say is uh, the grain talks inside. Um, we're going to be doing testing there shortly. Um, you know, there there is literature out there that show showing that AITC is a very effective at controlling E. coli and Salmonella on food. Uh, so so uh, you know the key is is that we own the technology. Um, that has multiple um, different applications in different markets, uh, not only in terms of fruit and vegetable soil fumigation, but other areas. And, you know, we think that, uh, you know, there, there, there'll have to be registrations of all these different areas, but, but there, there's, there is groups out there that are looking for solutions to these problems. And, um, you know, I, we believe that our mustard-based product can provide uh, the, those solutions. Um. Would resistance to this mustard extract be expected to build over time, like like for chemical pesticides? Uh, we don't believe so. I mean, the, the way the active works, um, it dissipates out of the soil very quickly in that. And, uh, for, you know, the, from what uh, Colin has seen compared to other uh, types of biologics around the world, uh, we don't see this being an issue. Okay. Okay. That's good. Hope so. Um, Will you have to test each specific crop separately for uh, approval? Yes, uh, not necessarily. I mean, if if it, it it's more on the application. So if you're treating, hmm. um, you know, soil-borne diseases for for uh, that that affect strawberries and you know, say tomatoes. Um, it, again, it, our product is dissipated out of the soil before the farmer comes in and plants. So. It, uh, it shouldn't be an issue, but we have tested on lots of fruit and vegetable, different, different fruit and vegetable crops. Okay, sounds good. Um, are biologicals higher cost and therefore more applicable to high value crops, greenhouses and that sort of thing? Uh, they typically have been, yes. Um, okay. you, know, you, you, see, uh, you don't see a lot of biologicals being used in the broad-based acres, uh, uh, mostly in the high value fruit and vegetable crops. Uh, that being said, um, what we're seeing with our product is that um, it, we have great potential to compete versus uh, synthetic chemicals um, in those high value crops based on the application rates that we're seeing. And um, um, but getting into like uh, right now for what we see getting into, say, the, you know, the global wheat crop or whatever, uh, it, it might not we, we might, it might be too high cost for that. OK. So, so canola is the largest crop that you'd be looking looking at. But potentially, I mean, it all depends yeah. on okay. the disease and what the issue is. But like, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it, it, more work would need to be done. Okay, fair enough. Um, how is your cannabis? And this is the last question I've got here. So, uh, looking to the audience, if they have any more, uh, please type it in. Um, how how is your cannabis testing marketing coming along? Our canna, so our, in terms of uh, regulatory approval, so we're looking to get mm -hmm. our Canna MG, which is our mustard-based product registered with Health Canada for mm -hmm. use um, to treat the soil before it's brought into the greenhouse. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been working with them for over a year now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, we were told that it would take about 18 months for approval on that. Uh, so that, you know, we've been going back and forth with Health Canada on that. So hopefully by the end of the year, that's approved, depending on Health Canada. Uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the powdery mildew product that we've in licensed, again, that that product hopefully will be registered by the end of the year as well uh, with Health Canada um, uh, and, and, and all the indication that we've received is that it should be. Um, in terms of testing, though, we haven't tested these products. Well, the one product, the powdery mildew product had been used in the industry in the past in terms of testing our mustard based product on the cannabis. Uh, we haven't uh, tested that because um, to test these non-registered product products, these uh, they would have to be for crop destruct, and um, it's a very valuable crop to have to destroy um, if you're if you've been testing on that. So we haven't been able to find a partner to be able to do that yet. Okay, fair enough. Sounds like you got your hands full with everything else anyway. Um, 
Yeah, okay. but I think I think once we're registered, though, uh, you know, that will open up uh, for testing and uh, you know potential potential sales in some of these uh, different you know for powdery mildew and that. Okay, okay, thanks for clarifying that. Um, any questions uh, from the audience? I know I know we're we're a little bit um, had a good long session here. I certainly had shot a lot of questions your way. Um, I'm just conscious of the fact that I believe you've got another meeting to go to uh, afterwards. So if anybody Rob, wants to type anything in the chat box. I think, Raj, I think there's another one from Richard Hart in the chat board. Did, didn't we do that earlier or is it come? Oh, we've got somebody who wants to speak. Let's see if we can get this to work. Um, I'm going to accept and let's see if I accepted uh, Tundra Williams. So I think I, I clicked the button. So at your end, you just need to go through the steps and approve sharing video and whatnot, and you'll be hopefully in here in a sec. We'll just um, give this audience attendee. Yeah, Mark, I think, do you see an, uh, another chat question? I don't. I think we covered that earlier. OK. Yeah, I, 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 he, I guess Richard had two questions. So that was the second one. So yeah, that's OK. Do, do you have it? Because it got erased here when we when we reviewed. Oh, it says if you get approval from EPA by June, when would you guess that you would have some cash flow? What is your burn rate? Would you think you need to do a raise? Uh, yeah. So if we get our EPA approval by June, um, we potentially could have sales uh, in the the you know I guess in the second half of the year. Um, you know, you know. When we had the seven hundred thousand dollars of sales of the granular product back in about twenty thirteen ish, um, so lots of those were repeat sales. So we there is customers out there that have been phoning about that product uh, in the past, wanting us to bring it back into the market. So there is potential that we could get some of those sales initially as well. Um, um, and and uh, no, we we have a you know with two point three million dollars on hand, we have enough cash uh, on hand to get us into twenty twenty two. Uh, without having to uh, to raise money uh, enough money to to get our registrations done and do the uh, the testing that we've identified um, that we want to do right now on blue sky uh, blue sky work and then moving some of these other areas uh, forward and that so um, we'll have enough cash on hand to get regulatory approval. Okay, Corey, I think um, I think the clock's ticking here. Uh, we've had a good amount of your time. Um, well, thank you. I want to overrun on on, on your next meeting. But um, thank you um, to Mustro for, for being with us, our 19th yep. Take Stock Live. And uh, thank you to all, all the attendees. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, do go to today's company's website, um, reminding me at this point to, to load the <laughs> to multitask here. Um, here's the information you need to go to the company's website, uh, learn more about them, and check in at takestocklive.com, uh, where the deck and, uh, and videos of, of this and Previous um, um, episodes are all posted. Uh, be determined in your due diligence and ask tough questions. We'll be back next Wednesday with a great lineup of mining opportunities. Mark and Raj signing out for Take Stock Live.